Finally, in Scripture, saving faith unto eternal life is established in Scripture as follows. 1 John 5, 9-13. This fellow who write, writes this article, he doesn't seem to take Scripture seriously. He's inventing his own phrases. He takes words that are in the Bible from different verses and throws them together, makes his own stuff up, and then adds a few of his own. We accept man's testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God which he has given about his son. Who else? Supreme testimony is the, is the testimony of God. Accepting the testimony of God about his son is presented here as an agreement that what God is saying about his son is true. Mere mental assent. The next verse when, then defines accepting the testimony of God as believing. Anyone who believes in the Son of God has this testimony in his heart. The word heart there, in his mind. Take a look at the dictionary and in the, in the Bible. Check this. Heart equals mind. Anyone who believes that the Son of God, the Son, will provide eternal life for him has this testimony in his heart, in his mind, such that it is a part of his mental understanding that he is now saved unto eternal life. Anyone who does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because he has not believed his testimony as given God has given about his son. Boy, this really defines the word believe. So to be saved, one must believe in this testimony, accept the testimony of God is true, accept whatever is true is dictionary definition, and the testimony of God about his son, in this case for eternal life, the verb believe is herein defined relative to salvation and to, uh, unto eternal life as a mental assent, an acceptance. Uh, acceptance is true, that what God has says, what God says about his son is true. Nothing else is required here in order to receive eternal life, such as demonstrating this faith by some kind of action. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his son. In other words, if you want eternal life, trust in God's Son to provide it for you. He who has the Son has life. He who believes in God's testimony about his Son, that the Son will provide eternal life for him, if he merely believes in the Son doing this, has eternal life. <clears throat> he who does not have the Son of God, you have him by believing in God's testimony about his son. You possess the son in the sense that the son possesses you and you're part of his body. So he does not have, the son of God does not have life. To have the son means to believe that he will provide eternal life for you. To not have the son is to take God at his word that the son alone will provide eternal life for you. So if you believe what God testifies to, then you will therefore have eternal life because God says so. God being who he is, he will deliver. And then John writes this great verse. He writes further that an individual can know that he is saved unto eternal life at the very moment of his mental ascent. I write these things to you who believe. Nothing more not acting right, repenting, or all kinds of other kinds of behavior. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know, you may know that you have eternal life. So taking God at his word about eternal life through his Son provides assurance that you do now possess the gift of life everlasting in heaven, never to lose it because it's not ten year life. It's everlasting. Well, one guy told me, well, you can lose it. You'll go to hell. Knowing you had possession of eternal life, but you have it. What? They make this stuff up. So nothing in the word believe relative to securing eternal life implies that any action is required beyond the simple trust. The simple mental assent stated in John 3.16 and numerous other passages in the Bible. Oops. Sorry about that. i go back to my spot here. Just as one would simply believe 
the do a door is green. Beyond that green door, remember that? Via a simple mental ascent, or that an individual who is physically incapable of vigorous movement can still believe that exercise is good for his health, i.e. a simple mental ascent, without actually performing the exercise itself. So in the same way, one can trust alone in Christ alone as one's personal Savior unto eternal life, without doing anything beyond the simple mental ascent. Consider that this is true especially since God has completed all that is necessary for any individual salvation. Ephesians 1, 3 to 2, 9. Great letter, six chapters. You master that, study it carefully, and you can go on to the other epistles and then branch out through the rest of the Bible. And consider this in the light that all men are totally depraved and incapable of contributing a single acceptable thing toward anyone's salvation. Now, believing is not a contribution, is it? What did I do? Did I help Jesus die on the cross for my sins? I believed in what he did for me, not me doing for him. So, in the light of that all men are totally depraved and incapable of contributing a single acceptable thing toward anyone's salvation, Romans 3.23, what does it say? Romans. Three. Now you get you went to two. There's another means for salvation. Do it through good works. Don't make a single mistake. But it says in Romans chapter three, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So your only option is not to do Romans two and do well and not sin and sin. Because what did you do before you learned the gospel? You probably sinned. Now you have sins that you can't undo. You better go with the other way. Since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. So you go the second way. The second route is accept what Christ did for you by faith alone. 8.8, 8, Isaiah 64.6, 6, all have fallen short of the glory of God. So, Take the free gift. Now, the new church that does say salvation is a free gift from God, but the way we accept that free gift is by following his word. Wow! Does this guy read English properly? I wouldn't want to deal with him in a contract. He'd violate it every second of the way. Bible study manuals. Absolutely not. Free means no strings attached, no conditions. This disqualifies the condition of having to follow God's word in order to have eternal life. That's a condition. Free means unconditional, as in God's unconditional agape love for mankind. Furthermore, one following God's word in order to be given eternal life is impossible with mankind in his mortal life. We already looked at 1 John 1, 8 and 10. Say so you have not sinned, you're a liar. So for one to attempt to follow God's word in order to have eternal life would be simply to take away from him the free gift of eternal life, which is solely via a moment of faith alone in Christ alone, by the grace of God. For this would rule out God's grace. Salvation then becomes conditional upon the faithful, faithfulness and faithful works of an individual. And this condition cancels out God's grace in providing salvation because following God's word demands human doing. Works. And that must be done perfectly. You want to do that? Be ye perfect. Furthermore, for how long and to what degree must one follow God's word in order to have eternal life? Answer. Eternal life can only be earned by perfectly following God's word 24-7 from the moment that you are held accountable continuously throughout one's entire lifetime. Something that is impossible with man and which contradicts God's grace, thus canceling the means by which God provides eternal life to an individual. For 1 John 1, 8 through 10 indicates that no believer can claim to have not sinned or to have no sin 
i.e. to have followed God's word faithfully all the time. So no one can claim to perfectly follow God's word at any time, putting eternal life completely out of reach for anyone. Now, newchurch.org says, does it make sense that this is completely different from trying to earn salvation by adding up our good deeds or following the Old Testament rituals? No, it makes no sense at all, according to what the scripture says. Both are efforts, works, which an individual must continuously perform over one's entire mortal lifetime perfectly in order to attain, maintain the level of the righteousness of God, which is impossible with mortal sinful man. We've looked at that. Isaiah 64, 6 is it? Romans 11, 6. Works destroy the basis of our salvation by grace through faith because our salvation is not of ourselves. At any time, it is the gift of God, not by works, lest one should boast. So you can't brag about doing following the law or whatever. Oh, I'm, I'm a good believer. Look how I'm behaving. Well, the problem is that doesn't justify your faith, uh, your salvation. It's by faith alone. For our salvation is by grace, and it is not on the basis of works, in the sense of any human participation. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Romans 11, 6. Take a look. Romans 11, 6. For if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works, anything. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. They're mutually exclusive. Well, New Church keeps on going. So while we are in agreement about that, and we're not, I don't see anything in the Bible that indicates salvation is immediate. We are not in agreement at all. Check the verb tenses in salvation and to eternal life passages. They always indicate that the possession of eternal life is immediate upon the first moment of faith alone in Christ alone. It's called present tense. New Church. It all depends on what you mean by saved. Bible study matters. Ephesians 2, 6, 8 to 9 refers to a salvation and to eternal life. A heavenly destiny, according to Ephesians 2, 6, that's the subject. The only subject of my email to you. There are other meanings for the words rendered salvation and saved but not here in these salvation unto eternal life passages that indicate, well, if you're going to go to heaven, that's not you're saving money in the bank. New Church, I believe the Lord wants to save us from doing evil. Of course the Lord wants to save us from doing evil. That's why he's going to give us a resurrection body. But this is another kind of salvation, which kind is outside of the context of attaining salvation unto eternal life. <clears throat> in order for an individual to be saved from doing evil, first and foremost, we must exercise a moment of faith alone in Christ alone unto eternal life in order to immediately possess eternal life. Whereupon begins the Christian life immediately at the point of faith where in the now indwelling Holy Spirit within the now alive human spirit of that individual must do many things in order to get the now born again believer to resist doing evil. Not the least of which is to study scripture, confess sins, with the understanding that only at the resurrection, and to a perfect resurrection body, will a believer be saved from doing evil, not before. For everything a believer does before resurrection contains some evil. 1 John 1, 8 to 10. New Church says, has he saved me from doing evil? Yes. Wow. You can't admit to having one moment without sin in this mortal body with the sin nature in it. Yes, many times. Wow, can I say when I am actually doing evil that the Lord has saved me from doing evil? Not honestly. This is another context outside of the context of attaining salvation unto eternal life. No one can claim to have not have sinned or have no sin for even a short period of time in this mortal life. 1 John 1, 8, 1 John 1, 10, of which both are ways of saying and one cannot say in this mortal life that God saved me from doing evil in this temporal life. So no one can say that God saved him from doing evil because in this mortal body even believers continually do evil. New Church, there is no question that once a person is saved, they remain saved to eternity. If by saved you mean brought into heaven. <coughs> Agreed. That is after all, all the subject of this discussion in Ephesians 2.6 and then 8 and 9. 
as in accordance with what Ephesians 2, 